Welcome everyone to Plastics Frontiers webinar series. The Plastics Frontiers webinar series was developed by the collaboration between the Royal Australian Chemical Institute, Society of Plastics Engineers, Australia, New Zealand, and Society of Chemical Industry. We are thankful for the sponsorships from BSF Australia, Record Bank Kaiser, Quenos, and Foundry Intellectual Property. For any concerns, please reach out to RACI. We are also thankful to the organizing committee, Gary Bowman, Chair of RACI Industrial Chemistry and Dr. Yvonne Ma, Han Michel, President of the Society of Plastics Engineers Australia, New Zealand, and Dr. Steve Petanakis, Jenny Sharwood, OAM of the Victorian Education Committee for RACI, and Dr. Richard Twitz, also Chair of Society of Chemical Industry. The purpose of the series is to highlight the continually evolving role and important contributions of plastics in society, some key societal and environmental issues faced by the plastics industry, and how the industry is rising to these challenges with new innovations and practices. With our backgrounds in education, industry and academia, we are reaching out to as many sectors ranging from secondary chemistry teachers and students to researchers and innovators in industry and in universities. We hope you enjoy this series. Thank you for watching. I'll just introduce myself to everyone. My name is Richard Thwaites, former president of the Victorian branch of the Royal Australian Chemical Institute, and I'm also currently the chair of the Society of Chemical Industry uh, Australian International Group. And of course, I'm a member of the organising committee for this series of webinars together with uh, other representatives from the RACI and the Society of Plastics Engineers. My job is to chair the session today, and I'd like to welcome everyone uh, and to acknowledge the original custodians of the land, in my case, uh, where I'm sitting, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and I'd encourage others to do so too. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge our generous sponsors who've contributed to the financial success of the webinars, namely BASF, um, Reckitt Benkiza, Quenos, and Foundry Intellectual Property Proprietary Limited. Um, this is the fourth webinar in our Plastics Frontiers series with the subtitle, Innovative Research, A New Future. And we have three very distinguished speakers today from Australia, uh, the UK and Germany, who I shall uh, more formally introduce shortly. Each will speak for around 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, and may I say that I'm a former soccer referee. So after 20 minutes, our speakers will get a yellow card. And after 25 minutes, they will get a red card. So, I, oops, there it is. I hope it's there. There it is. So I hope that uh, you'll be able to uh, keep to time. After the, each of the speakers has uh, uh, given their presentation, um, there will be a panel discussion and everyone will be on mute during the presentations, of course. But can I encourage people, um, if you have a question, to type it into the Q&A box at the foot of the screen and my organising committee colleagues and I will have access to these and we'll do our best to address as many of them as possible during the panel discussion. So without further ado, our first speaker today is David Hawkins, Chairman and Managing Director of BASF Australia and New Zealand. David has held this role in BASF since July 2016 and is responsible for BASF's business and operations in Australasia, serving key industries in the agriculture, coatings, manufacture, and mining sectors. David believes in inclusive leadership that builds trust and supports people to be their best. He has Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Engineering degrees from Monash University, an MBA from Deakin University, and is a graduate member of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. He became chair of the industry body Chemistry Australia, formerly known as PASHA, or the Plastics and Chemicals Industries Association, in March 2019. And David's talk today is entitled Breaking the Plastics Wave. 
So I hope everyone will please give David a warm, even if it's only a virtual, welcome. So David, over to you. Thanks, Richard. Um, hopefully you can see my screen okay. Can I just get verification? Yep, all good. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, this topic. And I guess I'm going to speak mainly from a perspective of BASF, but I can also uh, talk a little bit from the broader industry perspective. And certainly something that we're spending a lot more time on and talking more, uh, establishing some advocacy positions and other things around here in Australia at the moment. So it's not going to be super detailed or super technical, but sort of gives a, a view across um, the sort of the multi-dimensional elements around this particular problem. Um, and it's mainly from a from, from not just an Australia point of view, more from a global point of view as well, but um, we can certainly drill down into any Australian questions you might have in the Q&A. So hopefully my screen will... Move forward. Okay, so this is, this is me. Uh, Richard mentioned most of these things. Uh, Really, I, I do have a chemical engineering degree. It was some time ago. So technical questions, um, not too hard would be what I would ask. Um, and I'll do my best to answer what I can. Um, three teenage daughters. So um, done a lot of work with them around their sports, um, including uh, being their basketball coach. I'm a champion of change coalition. So this is where we talk about um, promoting gender equity uh, and certainly with some of the things that are happening in Australian Parliament at the moment, certainly a very topical issue here in Australia. Uh, and I am a Carlton Football Club tragic, although it's been a pretty tragic start to the year um, and hopefully things get better. Although Steve tells me maybe not so much in the short term. So a little bit about BASF, um, world's leading chemical company over 150 years old, um, lots of customers in lots of different industries, um, of course, safety and environment are key, and we talk about our triple bottom line, and increasingly part of what we do and part of our business models going forward. We have a company purpose of we create chemistry for a sustainable future. Um, we are talking more on climate protection. We did talk about carbon management and a, and a target towards net zero by 2050 just recently, and of course, the circular economy, which we'll touch on today. Uh, about 8,000 SKUs um, and about 200 basic products in our portfolio. I guess when you're talking about the concept around plastics and plastic waste, um, number of comment, commentary here, and all this will be familiar to everyone on the, on the call, I'm sure. Um, you know, basically, um, you know, the, the, the trends around um, plastic and the, and the avoidance thereof, or, or, or its, its role in the, in the linear economy and in its role in terms of uh, waste, and waste in oceans and other things. And you know, up to 8 million tonnes of plastics enter the ocean every year. Uh, 1 million plastic bottles are purchased around the world every minute. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a global comprehensive problem, um, but we also know that plastics are also part of, part of the, uh, the, the, the benefits as well. So it's not all, all, uh, all sort of one way. And I guess when we're talking about our advocacy, I think we're, we're, we're increasingly seeing the nuanced approach. And I think this presentation goes somewhat into that nuanced approach and the different elements we see around the challenges we'll have in industry and the challenges we'll have to actually get to a greater recycling component for plastics. So this is a graph that we talked about where the current situation, where basically of all plastics waste at the moment, 20% is going into mechanical recycling, 40% is going into disposal and 40% is mismanaged. Um, so you can see there's a large problem and a, a large area for opportunity. And I guess when we talk about breaking the plastic wave, it's really talking about changing this dynamic and looking at the different parts of the value chain, which, which we've sort of de de detailed here. And we have sort of different elements that we're gonna, I'm gonna pick out. I'm not gonna go into super detail in all of them, but it certainly gives, gives you a bit of an insight as to where we in BSF are, are looking to play a more active role. And there will be other parts of the industry, of course, playing active roles in their, in their various value chains. Um, and of course, there's, there's elements across all the areas that we're gonna to have to address. There's no singular magic bullet, um, although we'd like, you know, a lot of people and a lot of brand owners would love to have a magic bullet of say chemical recycling. Um, there's certainly a role to play, 
but there's you know it's a multi-dimensional problem and a multi-dimensional solutions. So I guess when we look at reducing, um, of course, it's about reducing things like single-use plastics, and we're seeing lots of legislation in this space um, about um, avoiding plastic bags. Certainly relevant here in here in Victoria. Um, reuse of, uh, increasingly for where the consumer will be reusing items and, and avoiding the need for, for obviously new plastic bags. Um, and also some industry models such as return systems or reuse such as wooden pellets and other things. So certainly uh, the role of the consumer um, is, is clear there and the role of the industry to actually take a lead in some of these challenges. So in terms of substitution, of course we can substitute by different products. Uh, paper being one, it has it has challenges as well, but certainly things like shopping bags and straws, coated paper, also um, a substitute around plates and food containers and food packaging, and compostables. Um, certainly, we have a, an offer of compostables, and um, we're seeing some media attention around um, around this space. But certified compostables are, are, are definitely part of the solution for uh, you know in commercial in, in commercial applications. So. Um, we're seeing a lot of local councils here in my suburb of, of Glen Iris in, in Melbourne um, now take a green waste with these combustible bags which you put your green waste in and they'll take that to a, to a council driven com, uh, compost which will break down that material. Um, the certification is really important because um, some products in this space can only break down into basically microplastics and of course that's just exacerbating the problem. So, what, so I guess the role of, of, of government and the role of standards is important in this space um, and, it, and really goes across um, many of the areas that I'll talk to today. Of course, we can reduce mismanaged waste. Um, government needs to play a very active role as well as industry here, ensuring about uh, appropriate facilities, not too much open burning in, in, in Australia, but certainly elsewhere and in certainly parts of Asia. Um, of course, waste collection is part of part of any sort of any recycling process. So government playing a role there, and facilities to dispose. Of course, government and industry leading there. Um, and I guess the national waste plan is an example of the Australian government putting in redu reductions in plastic waste exports. And I guess also the role of standards and the role of education um, for government and industry around um, what to do with plastic waste, how to classify it. Um, and other elements which will, which will help in terms of the management of waste. So in terms of when we get to end of life and we are looking at disposal, um, there, are, there are some options where uh, increasingly using thermal process to, to transform plastic waste into fuel, certainly not very prominent currently. Um, it's certainly technically possible whether it remains as, as something that's a, that's a good use of of plastic, I guess we'll, we'll wait and see. Landfill, probably a common element here for Australia. Um, you know, we're really driving behaviour to move plastics out of landfill, um, and certainly a pathway which which local the Australian government is really pushing in terms of its waste plan, uh, a plan to uh, to move away from from plastics into landfill. And of course, incineration or, or uh, waste to energy. Uh, also, something that I think uh, probably a, a, a common element in the European landscape, less so here in Australia, will probably need to be one of the options. Um, so, which would require, of course, better sorting up front to, to minimise the amount that would get to this sort of end of life process. And then state of the art energy recovery with gas, flue, gas, flue gas cleaning, uh, an important part of that solution. So I guess probably more into the into the parts that people generally think about when they think, think about how, how we're going to tackle this plastic waste issue. Mechanical recycling, we're really bringing, back, bringing the plastic waste back to the back to the before the plastics production and really reusing it into like type products. So PET bottles, examples of this, newspaper, glass or other examples of, of things where we take it back and then able to reuse that product in very similar applications. Um, and there's also a chance to actually bring it back to a pallet base and then convert it to other materials. So certainly technically possible. I know that Steve, your group does some of this um, and also the integrated packaging group or the ProPack group. Um, and I guess the challenge there, certainly in Australia at the moment is an end market for products. 
um, and certainly there's been success in things like um, railway sleepers and a few other examples, but uh, working, I know we're working hard from the industry point of view on how do we create a market for these end use products that can be, uh, that can be a result of mechanical recycling. And I guess in terms of what, where could mechanical recycling be and where's the trends around um, improving the, the, the efficiency for mechanical recycling is around um, basically one material shoes and the future craft loop by Adidas and, and, and of course us is an example of this where we use a high tech material TPU which allows of course that to be easily recycled. Um, and we're seeing some examples around the, the use of uh, recycled ocean plastic waste in shoes. Um, and we think that those are, those are good applications and increasingly we'll see the role of raw materials and raw material specifications into ensuring these sort of end of life or, or closed loop uh, applications around mechanical recycling. And some of the spaces we play, um, we've got a, a, a new device that's relatively uh, a new innovation which, which is about allowing us to determine the type of plastic. And it's done through this sort of handheld spectrophotometer and then linked to an application on your mobile phone, um, especially in field use for how do we classify uh, that particular plastic waste and where can we put it to be uh, most effective in terms of its recyclability. Um, and so we've brought a couple of these units into Australia and we'll certainly start to see if we can see up good applications here uh, for that technology. And of course, in any mechanical recycling process, we need to extend the life and some of our products uh, can, can, can support uh, some functional additives to, to actually help um, extend the life of PET bottles and to repair broken chains. And of course, we're looking to improve the efficiency of plastics recovery when we do, when we do that. So I guess the two elements that probably uh, uh, um, uh, things we're probably talking a little bit more about is the integrated chemical industry here in Australia, but also from a BSF point of view, certainly part of our sustainability push is around um, chemical recycling and principally around pyrolysis, but depolymerization plays, plays a role as well. And I guess these are probably sometimes considered as the magic bullet as to how we can increase recycling um, and how we can, how we can uh, how we can close the loop on a number of plastic waste issues. Um, and of course, what needs to be done around depolymerization, I mean, infrastructure is key. Um, waste sorting is key because it really does require a very, very um, clear segregation of, of different materials and a regulatory environment that will support that. Uh, and pyrolysis is somewhat, somewhat the same. So this is by a good example of uh, of the BSF chain around 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 cyclability and the chem cycling. So this is with this pyrolysis project, and it sort of gives you a nice look into the different steps that are, that we are using as a company, but also similar steps from what we will be using as a as a country in terms of setting up an infrastructure to treat plastics into this chemical cycling space. So if you start at the in the orange box at the top right. Um, Actually, I'll start the blue box, which says number one. So we'll start there. Um, so it's obviously starts with the consumer um, and ideally about um, segregation where we can, but certainly the waste companies collect that, that, um, those waste materials. And then we use a process of pyrolysis to turn that plastic waste uh, into oil through the thermochemical process. So that's plastics and tires. Um, so the pyrolysis oil is purified. It's used as feedstock at the beginning of our of our Vabun production, so that's our uh, our big reactors, um, and and then basically we use a mass balance approach to allocate the recycled feedstock to all chemicals produced in the Vabun. So basically, it's a certified process where, um, effectively, based on mass mass balance principles, that we have X amount of recyclable material uh, in the end products. Of course, a mass balance approach is really important there because um, we can't, you know, we can't ensure that particular molecule that's gone into that particular um, end product has come from that recycled source. Um, and so, certainly, some work to do for us in the Australian landscape to uh, create a certified approach to that problem. And then, basically, we're back to the start in terms of what we can turn that that product into. We can really much turn it into anything downstream of our value chain, including things like automotive products, more plastics. 
um, and really is a tr truly circular, uh, truly circular process. So basically, um, with chem cycling, so plastic waste will be recycled. There's no, I mean, basically this is happening today. It's happening in limited quantities. Um, there was a recent trial done even here in Australia with a consortium of companies. Um, so this chem cycling process is uh, is certainly active and producing end products today, although not at, not at a high rate. Um, so obviously the, the the sort of plastics which are key for these sort of chemical cycling processes are the ones that aren't really well suited to mechanical recycling. Uh, we know that plastics with adhering food residues um, continue challenge for mechanical recycling. The multi-layer food packaging, um, tires, these sort of things are, are great uh, great candidates to put back through this chemical cycling arm. And I guess when we think about chemical chem chemical recycling, it's not in competition to mechanical recycling. In many ways, it requires uh, all avenues across all the things I've talked about to be able to address the uh, address the, the different uh, challenges we see in the different parts of the value chain. And as I mentioned before, the chemically recycled plastic um, using a mass balance approach basically achieves the same level of quality and purity as virgin plastics. And we can manufacture that back to meet high quality and hygiene standards, especially in the food packaging, which is an ongoing challenge for mechanical recycling. Um, and you might ask, well, why don't we just go straight to chemical recycling? Why do we bother with all the rest of all, all the rest of the of the elements? Um, and I guess the true is the, is 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 the carbon required to manage through the process. Um, Sorry, right, my screen just decided to. There we go. Um, so basically, if we take a life cycle ana analysis, then the best, the, the most efficient way to recycle plastics is actually mechanical recycling. Uh, has a lower carbon footprint, requires lower energy, um, and it should always be the the, the first first choice in terms of recycling. But chemical recycling is obviously a better than, than incineration um, and has circularity. So um, when we look at options, I guess, beyond the, the avoid, we're really looking at mechanical recycling and then chemical recycling. And so this is sort of like the picture that, um, that we see for how these different elements will play into breaking this plastic wave as we've used more plastics in, in the way that we live our lives. Um, that reduce and substitute um, take up a significant part of breaking the plastic plastic way. But then that element of recyclability, including mechanical and chemical recycling, obviously managing different disposal mechanisms, and then finally, of course, pushing that mismanaged section down to zero is obviously the uh, the, the goal. And where circular economy plays is really on all those reduce, substitute, recycle, and dispose elements. And we know that this is becoming increasingly part of, uh, of what governments and what the consumer is looking for. And certainly brand owners are very, uh, you know, set a lot, of, a lot of goals and a lot of aspirations around this space. So we know public awareness is increasing, leg legislation is coming, companies are setting their own targets um, and, you know, virgin materials, uh, I guess we're, we're, seeing, uh, we're seeing renewable virgin materials become part of the mix and certainly part of the mix for BSF as well. So Richard, I've covered a lot there. It was a, probably a longer presentation in a short 20 minutes. I hope, um, I hope I've sort of managed somewhat to, somewhat to time and pass back to you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, certainly appreciate keeping to time, which is great. And uh, thank you very much indeed for a, uh, uh, a stimulating overview of, uh, of uh, plastics recovery, recycle and reuse. Um, we'll save questions, I think, to the end. And so at this stage, um, thank you, David, I'll introduce formally uh, Professor uh, Anthony J. Ryan, Tony Ryan, OBE, uh, from the University of Sheffield. Uh, Tony is the Professor of Physical Chemistry at the University of Sheffield and the founding director of the Grantham Centre for Sustainable Futures. Tony is active in translational research, disseminating evidence-based science to both experts and non-experts, 
and has been a regular contributor to UK radio, um, TV, national press, and uh, at learned uh, and at learned societies, from the Royal Society of Chemistry to Chatham House. He presented evidence at the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, Conference of Parties COP21 in Paris in 2015 and returned to COP22 in Marrakesh in 2016. Tony's research covers sustainable synthesis, structure processing and applications of polymers using advanced analytical and measurement techniques. And recent research projects have included renewable sources for polyurethane synthesis, organic photovoltaics, maximizing the properties of polymers and biopolymers through flow-induced crystallization, formulation of home and personal care products and polymer foams for high-intensity urban agriculture. And the emphasis throughout is on understanding the fundamental science and technology in order to minimize resource use. Tony has co-authored more than 350 papers and patents and has authored two books. His textbook, Polymer Processing and Structure Development with Arthur Wilkinson is used in universities worldwide. His sustainability book, The Solar Revolution, co-authored uh, with Steve McEvitt, a social scientist, has had great reviews and puts into context how we, continue, how we come to live on a planet supporting 7 billion people and what we have to do to make it sure that it remains sustainable and prosperous for the foreseeable future. Now, Tony has a BSc and PhD from Manchester University, from the University of Manchester, and a DSc from the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. He held a NATO research fellowship at the University of Minnesota, was a lecturer, then a senior lecturer and reader in material science at the University of Manchester, and was seconded to the synchrotron radiation source at Daresbury in, in Daresbury. In 1997, Tony moved to Sheffield and served as head of chemistry before becoming the pro vice chancellor for the Faculty of Science in 2008, which he fulfilled until 2016. In 2002, uh, Tony delivered the Royal Institution Christmas lectures and was ordered uh, and was awarded an OBE in 2006 for services to science. Tony's um, theme, Tony's topic is the second century of plastics. What, why, what might we see? So I'll ask everyone to give Tony a very warm welcome, please. Over to you, Tony. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm sharing my screen now, so I hope uh, I hope you can all see. I can't see you, so uh, verbal feedback would help. All good, all good. Tony. Okay, good. Thank you. So, um, yeah. So, as you heard, my name is Tony Ryan. You heard a lot about me uh, already, so I won't dwell on that. Um, so I'm going to present a rather um, radical view of what we might do in the long term future. Um, so from the first century to the second century of plastics, it's only 100 years since organic chemists uh, admitted that polymers existed. And, um, and biopolymers uh, got us started, but then we fell in love with plastics from fossils, polyethylene, polypropylene, PVC, polystyrene. PET that we've heard about, nylon, polyurethanes, uh, but now collectively the world seems to hate them. Um, I don't think biopolymers and postables have a very big role to play, they're not the answer, and everyone seems to be searching for the answer. Um, and we definitely need to move to a plastic circular economy, as we heard from David. Um, but the question I'm going to ask is, can we make neo-fossils, new fossils in the future, non-degradable plastic from agricultural waste, and use that to capture carbon from the atmosphere and then securely bury it? So I want to reassure you that at the University of Sheffield, we have a really big group um, <clears throat> of scientists and engineers, social scientists, 
behavioral scientists, economists, even linguists working on a circular economy, um, how to stop the, all the losses of plastic uh, from the system and, and recycle and more importantly, reuse. Um, I run a project called Many Happy Returns about reusable packaging uh, for uh, the food industry. And people really want to do the right thing. Um, and that's why kind of greenwash cynical marketing works. This is my favorite example. Uh, I hope there's no one uh, in the audience from this company um, because I, I am picking on them uh, today. Dasani Water is an American water brand. Um, basically, it's tap water. That's why it says purified on the bottle. Um, so you buy in something that you could get out of the tap for free uh, and it's in a plant bottle. And, and I'll come back to plant bottles. Uh, plant bottles, to be perfectly honest, ridiculous. Um, people want to buy compostables everywhere you go, every cafe you go in, the kind of greener the cafe, the less green it's packaging, uh, in my view. Um, compostables only really work if you have an industrial composter. Um, depending on how they're dealt with, um, they end up with different things. You can get fragments. Um, people have now started to realize that home composting for plastics doesn't work. We ran a home composting experiment um, as part of the UK's uh, Plastic Research uh, Infrastructure Fund and, um, and got people to bury plastics in their home compost heap and then, and then go back and try and find them again. And practically everything that's labeled um, compostable will not compost over any reasonable time scale uh, in a home compost heap. And if they do compost, what do they compost to? Well, they go back to water and carbon dioxide, if you're lucky. Um, and if the compost is not working really well, they'll make methane, which is a 10 times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So, so compostables, unless they're dealt with really well, are a, are a bad idea. Um, not only do they degrade back to the things you don't want them to degrade back to, the energy inputs to make them, therefore the carbon emissions to make them, are often higher than the materials they replace. And I'll show that later. So my favorite newspaper is The Guardian. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a UK um, left-wing professor, so what else would I read? Um, and. Uh, and they had this article, a million bottles a minute, the world's plastics binge as dangerous as climate change. Bullshit. Climate change is what we need to be worried about. Plastics waste is a convenient truth. You can see it. But only 5%, and it's rising, but only 5% of oil and gas is turned into plastic. As we saw earlier, all the recycling schemes currently have enormous energy investments that produce CO2 and 80%, 87% of oil and gas is burned, making CO2 and causing global warming and particulates causing respiratory diseases. Um, this graph comes from a first year chemistry course I teach. When I was born in 1962, carbon dioxide was, two, was 320 parts per million not a great deal above the pre-industrial level. When my current PhD students were born, it was 360. So it had gone up another 40. Um, in a 40 year period. And today, 420. One of my former PhD students, Dave Sutton's actually at the seminar. He worked in the refinery at Geelong. Um, and uh, yeah, the, there was only 10 ppm difference between my birth and his. But between today's PhD students, who are 40 years younger than me and mine, another 40 ppm. And, and in their lifetime, another 60 ppm, it's accelerating. And the blue line is on the graph to show you how it's accelerating. We're still putting more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year, even though we've signed the, planet, the Paris Climate Accord. 
And the Paris Climate Accord contains all sorts of technologies and policies to decarbonize. And if we don't, the global temperature is going to continue to rise. Coral leaf, reefs are gonna to continue to disappear. And there'll be a temperature overshoot, undoubtedly. And the Paris Accord has, has basically this prediction that all of a sudden, rather than energy consumption continuing to rise and be based on fossils, all of a sudden we'll, be, we'll go into this phase, this transition of rapid decarbonization and technologies that have negative emissions. And what kinds of technologies? Well, there's all sorts of ideas. Um, you know, if, if you offset your, your pain to plant trees, uh, you, can, you can weather rocks. Um, so, so, so dig out silicate minerals that absorb carbon dioxide. Have improved wetlands, have, um, have basically farms in the sea to grow seaweed. Um, artificial upwelling to bring uh, nutrients to the surface, uh, fertilize the sea with iron, add alkali to the sea. And then the, then the even crazier things like um, direct air capture of carbon dioxide and its burial. So afforestation, so af afalu, agriculture, forestry and other land use, um, forestry could sink 4, 000, 4 gigatons of carbon dioxide a year. Wetlands could sink 4 gigatons of carbon dioxide a year. They're enormous amounts of trees and the recreation of wetlands that we've drained. If we change the way we farm by going to no-till agri no agriculture, we can maybe put two gigatons of carbon dioxide a year back in the ground. Um, and biochar, maybe another 0.2 of a gigaton of carbon dioxide a year. And these are the, these are the numbers um, from the Climate Change Convention. But bioenergy and carbon capture, BECs, and carbon capture, storage and utilization, there are no demonstrated technologies at scale. They're more like the fairy stories that we hear constantly from our prime minister. But there is a technology that's readily available and all around us that's the most efficient carbon capture technology we know, and that's photosynthesis. The light reaction splits water to liberate oxygen and hydrogen, and the hydrogen in the dark cycle, the Calvin cycle, the dark reaction, reacts with carbon dioxide to make carbohydrate, organic molecules, and from that, all life proceeds. And obviously, we, we grow all our food, we ultimately grow all our food. So photosynthesis on the land produces, fixes 250 gigatons per year of carbon dioxide to produce biomass. 10% of photosynthesis is agriculture. That's 25 gigatons a year. And of that 25 gigatons, about five gigatons is food and about, well, nearer three gigatons uh, are cereals. And there's 20 gigatons of biomass agricultural waste. And what happens to it? Well, it depends where you are. Some of it's left on the field to rot. Some of it's plowed back in as fertilizer. Both of those cause CO2 emissions. And then there are the obvious CO2 emissions of the agricultural waste being burned in situ on field or collected for fuel. And clearly they have CO2 emissions. 
on a US prairie hectare, and I imagine Australian cereal production is similar, um, a US prairie produces eight tons of wheat and 12 tons of straw. Um, the carbon budget in year is about 30 tons per hectare. Tens turned over in respiration, kind of running the chemical plant that is the plant. Um, 20 tons are fixed. And of that 20 tons, there's eight in food and 12 in waste. And if you do no-till agriculture, so you drill the seed, you don't turn the soil over, then you can return about two tons of carbon to the soil pool by the natural processes that take place uh, by leaving the cover on the ground. Um, you could even plant a cover crop that then degrades and puts um, soil back into the uh, carbon back into the soil pool. But of that 12, 10 of it's returned to the atmospheric pool. It goes back into the atmosphere. So of the 30 tonnes of carbon that the hectare turns over, two goes into the soil, eight goes to people, and tens return to the atmospheric pool. So, back to plastic. PET versus bio-PET, what's in a plant bottle? Well, if you read the details, it says the plant bottle is 30% made from plants. Okay, that 30% is the E in PET, the ethylene glycol. Oh. <clears throat> and it's a 100% recyclable bottle because once you've made ethylene glycol, you can't tell from the PET molecule whether it's plant ethylene glycol or fossil ethylene glycol, unless of course you do um, analysis of the carbon-13 ratio. What does the life cycle analysis say? So this is data from uh, the Journal of Cleaner Production uh, from a group in Minnesota, and they did a comparative life cycle assessment of fossil and bio-based PET bottles. So to make PET, you take ethylene glycol and terephthalic acid, you make amorphous PET, you post preliminarize that to make bottle grade PET, uh, then you make bottle preforms, uh, and then you blow bottles often in a kind of hole in the wall process uh, next to the bottling plant. <clears throat> so the terephthalic acid comes from paraxylene, um, and the ethylene glycol typically comes from uh, ethylene ethylene to ethylene oxide to ethylene glycol, paraxylene to terephthalic acid. And to do the life cycle analysis, you draw a box around that. Um, and then to get to paraxylene and ethylene from biomass, um, you have to convert the biomass into, into C4 isobutanol, and then the isobutanol into paraxylene, or the biomass into C2 ethanol, dehydrate the ethanol to make ethylene, ethylene oxide, ethylene glycol. And, and I've shaded it in green and called it the biomass burden. And this is the process energy that's required to convert biomass into the chemical precursor for terephthalic acid uh, and ethylene glycol. The extra processes to get there, and they're currently done at a high carbon intensity. And then once you have terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol, the process thereafter is the same. So they used um, terephthalic acid from fossils, terephthalic acid from wood, and terephthalic acid from corn stover. That's the kind of bit of the corn that's left after you've taken the kernels off. Um, and then they used fossil ethylene glycol, food grade corn ethylene glycol, switch grass, which is a fast growing um, carbohydrate crop, um, ethylene glycol and, and wheat straw and agricultural waste ethylene glycol. Carbon emissions up here, oops. The lowest is fossil fossil. The highest 
is biomass, biomass. Um, and for every indicator, acidification, particulates, smog, yeah, the fossil fossil beats the biomass every time. And the only thing that biomass works on are the avoided impacts. Yeah, you're not burning the wood because it's wood waste that's used to make the terephthalic acid. And you're not burning the straw, the corn stover, that would otherwise be waste products that would either, either naturally degrade to carbon dioxide or get burned to carbon dioxide. That's because all the energy inputs in this calculation are essentially fossil energy inputs or the, the grid energy inputs, which are essentially fossil energy inputs. So should we burn more oil to make bioplastic? Well, why would you? Um, only 5% of oil and gas is converted into plastic. There might be situations where making polymers from renewable sources makes sense, but it depends on the life, life cycle analysis. And we should really only do it in, at scale when we've decarbonized the energy system. And once we've decarbonized the energy system, then we can use bioplastics to sequester carbon dioxide. <clears throat> we saw earlier um, that the feedstock to make plastic is from the chemical plant. And you can turn biomass into chemical plant building blocks. C1, T2, C2, C3, C4, all the way up to aromatics. And from them, make plastics. It's technology that's well known. Biorefining. And it's currently very energy intensive. And it always will be energy intensive. But the grid carbon intensity is falling. So the emissions associated with every process are falling. So these are the European predictions of the grid, in, the, the electricity grid, grid carbon intensity. I, I charge my electric car when I know it's going to be windy because in the UK, when it's windy, the grid carbon really falls. But over long term, as we decarbonize our energy system, there's going to be a crossover when the fossil polymer is associated with more emissions than the bio-based polymer because of the avoided emissions associated with the bio-based polymer. And eventually the bio-based polymer becomes net negative. You can even make polyethylene from biosources. Brass Chem have started a plant to do it. They take sugar cane, they make ethanol, they dehydrate ethanol and make polyethylene. And they sell it as green polyethylene, 100% recyclable. And of course it is, it's polyethylene. Currently though, it's not very green. It takes away from food production. <clears throat> and the energy emissions associated with making it a higher. So we've done a life cycle analysis for um, fossil PET, low density polyethylene and polystyrene, fossil based non-degradable polymers, bio PET, <clears throat> PBA, um, uh, an al an, a polyester used as a polyethylene replacement that's fossil based but biodegradable and polylactic acid, which is bio-based and biodegradable. So these are the current CO2 emissions per kilogram of polymer. The fossils are all lower than the bio and the degradable. And every polymer has a different balance in the source of its CO2 emissions. Electricity, which we've heard can be decarbonized by renewables, but there's also quite a bit of heat embedded in each polymer, and that's difficult to decarbonize. Plus there's the resource 
you know, wh where it comes from. So this is the British government's electricity defossilization forecast. So it, it's forecast to fall uh, the energy emissions per uh, kilowatt hour of uh, the carbon emissions per kilowatt hour of energy. Um, and we've used that data, uh, that forecast to do a time evolution of the LCA. Um, and to make the results kind of look a bit easier because we are actually doing a bit better than the government forecast for defossilizing UK electricity, we've used double the rate as well. So as you change the um, grid electricity, the carbon emissions per tonne of polymer uh, start to fall. And PLA is often used to replace polystyrene and it would make sense to do that on a carbon emissions basis in 2031. But bio PET and, uh, is, is always much, much worse than fossil PET. So now what we've done, we've rerun the calculations, but this time we've doubled the forecast rate of uh, decarbonisation of electricity. Um, and we've actually said that heat's going to decarbonise at the same rate. OK, that's really difficult. And we've done more calculations uh, around uh, hydrogen use uh, for heat. Um, but the picture is more or less the same. OK, um, if you if you double the decarbonisation rate, it makes sense to replace polystyrene with polylactic acid in 2025. But all of those benefits go away if you then biodigest the polylactic acid. And bio PET on all of these is never better than fossil PET, even with the avoided emissions. So here's my vision for what the plastics economy looks like when we've decarbonized the energy system. So we currently produce 300 million tons of plastic a year, and we produce 20 gigatons of agricultural waste. So if we use defossilized energy to make non-degradable plastic from agricultural waste, how much carbon could we sequester? And the answer is a gigaton of carbon dioxide per year, every year. So we need to look at how carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus flows in this neo-fossil pathway. So photosynthesis fixes carbon into crops. The crop waste goes to make non-degradable plastics and there are some niche areas where you won't be able to collect the plastic so you'd want it to be degradable. That comes to humans, back to humans through carbon in packaging and carbon in goods. And obviously the, the carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus in food. Um, that goes into people um, and we need to collect that carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus again and recycle it to recycle all the nutrients and the micronutrients and put them back on the field. And this carbon that's been converted into non-degradable plastic, we need to capture and bury and I don't mean litter, I don't mean landfill, I mean curate to store away for future generations, highly refined carbon to replace the highly refined carbon that geology had put there for us and make a new geological stock at the rate of a gigaton a year. 30 gigatons, of carbon in agriculture, five gigatons in food, one gigaton going underground. And how would we do it? Well, you wouldn't want to be transporting low grade carbon, right? So at the farm scale, um, food waste and agricultural waste, you'd want to ferment. And you might even want to do that on the farm scale and then have distillation plants maybe at the 100 kilometer 
scale. So many farms feed a distillation plant. And then a petrochemical plant on a country scale, on the thousand kilometer scale. I've drawn it out kind of simply for, for ethanol, to make, make an ethanol economy. Um, then dehydrate the ethanol, turn it into ethylene, and then we're away to the races. We make polyethylene, we use all the petrochemicals infrastructure uh, and chemistry to build up all the other uh, organic molecules we need. And why is burying plastic better than burying carbon dioxide? <laughs> well, it's a solid. Bioenergy with carbon capture and storage makes lots of carbon dioxide, but it's much easier to store plastic than it is to store carbon dioxide because you're burying a solid, you're not burying a gas. And if you look after the solid, then the leakage potential is vanishingly small. So what does a neofossil have to do? Well, it has to lock up carbon and safely go down a hole, not degrade back to carbon dioxide and water, so PLA is out. PET will work if we can lock it up. And thermoset composites look great. And here's the rub. We have to get away from, once we've set up a plastic circular economy, we might need to get away from it because the faster we can use plastic in a, a single use plastic, the faster we can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Tony. The, uh, the full polyethylene calculation is difficult. We're doing that now to work out when. Yeah. I'll finish now. Thank you. We want to make sure we're not distracted by the convenient truth of plastics waste. We want to understand the benefits we want to maintain in the circular economy for now. And then we want to work out how to sequester carbon dioxide by in the future going back to a linear plastics economy. Make fossils from plastic, not plastic from fossils, and put it back in the ground. Thank you, Tony. That's uh, a very challenging and uh, controversial, I would suggest, uh, mm. presentation. And I think that we'll have quite an interesting discussion on that uh, later on. But uh, as it's now uh, 25 past eight our time, I think it's time to uh, uh, introduce our third speaker, um, Dr. Teresa Shabat, um, who until recently was the development manager sustainability technology platforms at Synthema. Um, now, let me see what I've got to say about Teresa. Yeah, um, Teresa Sharbat uh, has a master's degree in chemistry from uh, St. Andrews University in Scotland, and then did completed her industry funded doctorate at the University of Oxford. Uh, was at, she was at St. Edmund Hall and she focused on organometallic catalysis. Starting at Synthema as a senior chemist in a global R&D group, she led projects related to sustainability in the consumer packaging, in the consumer packaging industry and battery binder development before being promoted to sustainability development manager at the end of last year. Now in this role, she's undertaken UK government funded projects and led cross-functional initiatives for sustainability. Now, Teresa is currently in Germany, but in the next uh, few months, Teresa is moving to Sydney and uh, is excited to pursue opportunities in Australia's chemical industry, she says. Now, Teresa is bilingual, German and English, but I think she's promised to do her presentation in English today, at least I hope so. So, Teresa, um, Great to have you, and uh, will everyone please welcome Teresa to speak now. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, um, Richard. I, I am planning on doing my presentation in English, don't worry, though I will have a German word in there, but it'll just be one, and I'll translate it too. So, <laughs> all good. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, can you just let me know when it, when you can see it? Yeah, it's fine. Yep, yep. Perfect. Thank you. 
All right, so thanks again uh, for having me. Um, sustainability and innovation is something that is very close to my heart. So it's a great opportunity um, to be here today and to share your thoughts, uh, to share my thoughts, how a chemical industry, in this case, specifically Synthema, um, can help through their product innovation to support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So just to give you a, a short overview of who Synthema is. Uh, we are a specialty chemical company and also one of the world's leading suppliers for water-based emulsions. Our headquarters are in the UK and last year we acquired Omnova which means that now we have about 38 production sites as well as nine technical centers um, across the globe. We are divided into three global business units. This includes functional solutions where we focus on adhesives, um, oil and gas and textiles, for example, through our acrylic as well as vanillic emulsion polymers. We have performance elastomers, which focuses on health and protection as well as um, paper, paper, carpet and foam with our nitrobutadiene rubber latexes and styrenbutadiene rubber latexes. And lastly, we've got industrial specialities which focuses on speciality additives, but as well as uh, non-water-based chemistries. And today I will show you product innovations across these three um, business units. So why do we talk about sustainability? Sustainability is a concept that's been around for centuries. Um, here's the fun fact of, of the day. It's actually been first published in a book about forestry in 1713. Um, and it's derived from a German word. Uh, which is Nachhaltigkeit, which really means sustained yield. But I think what we've seen over the last century, at least, is certainly kind of a shift in how we see or how we perceive the word sustainability. And probably the most common definition is now the definition from the Brutland Commission um, on sustainable development, which is to meet the needs um, of the present without, com uh, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And really what it means for us is that we want the three pillars, which um, I hear referred to um, economy, environment, society, to overlap and be at balanced. And that's when we truly achieve sustainability. The kind of rising global population, we see the um, more and more extreme weather events uh, that I know Australia has seen a lot in the last couple of years. Um, as well as the pollution of water and land um, really shows that we need to act uh, and we need to act now. And one way to do this is to look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, these 17 goals were introduced in um, two, 2015 and they really act as a blueprint to help us to achieve a more sustainable future. They've now been accepted by almost 200 countries and they're really here to encourage and facilitate actions from governments, NGOs, as well as uh, industry. They focus on the five Ps, people, planet, prosperity, peace and partnership, and actually have 169 targets associated um, to them. So that's giving us lots of room to um, actually have a, a closer look and see how we can help. At Synthema, we've decided to really focus on seven of these 17 goals. So we looked into kind of the positive as well as negative impact something we can have um, through our direct operations and also through our products across the value chain. And we've decided with these seven goals, it really gives us the required time and emphasis um, to really make a change. So if we look, for example, at goal three, which is good health and well-being, there's a target associated with that that says we should drastically reduce the number of death and illnesses coming from uh, hazardous chemicals, as well as pollution of land, soil and water. And I think, you know, this is something where the chemical industry certainly has a big impact and can really move things along. And it's also a goal that actually influences us directly the employees. So in this instant, uh, Synthema has uh, the 10 golden rules of safety, which um, you hear of the day you start there. And um, it really encourages and facilitates safe working. So I make sure that I'm safe as well as any other employees. Though the main kind of discussion today is really about product innovation. So how our products can facilitate further down the value chain potentially a positive impact on these SDGs. And the reason I talk about innovation as well is 
it is one of our core values at Sindama. And I think we're, we're quite proud to say that 20% in 2019 and 2020 actually um, are ba um, of sales are based on products we developed over the last five years. We've also actively started tracking sustainability criteria. They are summarized here on the on the right hand side. Um, I'll just turn my mouse into a pointer. Sorry, got to do that at the start. Um, so you can see we were looking at everything from air quality to kind of renewable or lower impact raw materials. And each um, product we, we look at, um, we try to um, associate the main sustainability criteria that it influences. And, you know, I think having these 20% of sales based on products we developed last in the last five years, for us, it's really into, important to show that we already have the sustainability thinking at the very start of product innovation. Um, I think right now what you can see in this in this graph is that we have really heavily focused on the first of the three of these sustainability criteria, but it certainly gives us a chance to highlight this and see how we want to adapt the product portfolio for the future. So I will talk uh, about examples from healthcare through to textile, through to lithium ion batteries um, today. And I I'll show you some examples that we have where we have an existing market and we've managed to introduce a more sustainable solution, or actually where we've been able to enter a new market for Sendama that has though a sustainable focus with our products. So, this is one of my favorite examples, and I think it, it's it's great because it's so relevant to today's society. So one of our products, Sunovis, is um, actually used in the manufacturing of medical gloves. Uh, and I think we've mentioned it at the start a bit as well. So obviously we, we'll all see the pandemic we're in right now. We see the society needs to wear PPE in certain instances um, and also increased use of, of PPE across the um, globe. And the, if we think about medical gloves, one of the primary functions is to ensure that we've got a good protection barrier. So with um, our Synovus technology, we looked into the kind of chemical resistance we have with N-hexane. And in this graph, you can see the breakthrough time, which means that's the time that uh, hexane broke through the gloves and also the rate it did it at. Um, and the longer the breakthrough time, the better protection barrier we have. So with our conventional nitrides, we see a breakthrough time around seven minutes. With our Synovus technology, we can increase it in the end to about 30 minutes. So really facilitating this primary um, function of a glove. The other benefit we have through that Synovus technology is actually we're using a novel crosslinker. And with this novel crosslinking system, um, glove manufacturers are now able to eliminate the use of chemical accelerators. And the chemical accelerators are actually known to cause allergic reactions. So again, seeing an increase in um, society of wearing gloves, it's really important to be able to eliminate things like this. And um, therefore, with this product, we certainly support uh, the third of the UN SDGs. It is really important to us, though, to also make sure we deliver on performance. So the cross-linking technology also allows us to reduce the curing temperature um, of the um, during manufacturing from about 120 degrees C to 70 degrees C. So uh, we've then been able to show that you could decrease the overall energy usage during manufacturing about to 20%. We were then quite intrigued to see, is this reflected in a um, greenhouse gas profile of these gloves? And we've partnered with a third party life cycle assessment expert and done an analysis of a cradle to grave of the medical gloves. If we look into um, nitrobutadiene rubber-based systems, we can see that the uh, Sunovus technology on the right-hand side has a actually lower um, impact on carbon dioxide compared to the conventional nitrobutadiene rubber-based systems with between 15 to 20%. And then if we look into non-nitrobutadiene rubber-based systems where we have natural rubber latex or PVC, we actually see a decrease in about 30%. And I think this is something that um, Tony kind of mentioned as well right now, because if we think natural rubber latex is a renewable source, but actually retrieving that renewable source has such a high carbon impact that it's then not reflected in the greenhouse gas profile. And it's something we really need to pay attention to. Um, so here 
again, on top of uh, the goal three, we also support goal 12 and 13. Another area that is of interest for us is high performance tapes. So high performance tapes normally require um, an adhesive that gives you strong adhesion and cohesion, as well as really good chemical resistance and can uh, very, um, work across a, a range of temperatures. So this market has been um, dominated by solvent borne and radiation cured adhesive. However, at Synthema, we've been able to create a new generation of emulsion pressure sensitive adhesives that now combine the classical strength and the benefit you get by water-based adhesives such as low order and low VOC, and actually also include innovative performance so we can observe strong cohesion and adhesion as well as really good chemical resistance. So as an example, if we look at the Plextor Prime 7525, we looked at the adhesion onto steel as well as high density polyethylene. So with steel, we can see an all around good performance um, as we would expect with water-based systems. When it comes to high density polyethylene, it gets a bit more complicated. Um, we know that this plastic is a low surface energy substrate and that normally means that water-based products tend to find it more difficult to adhere to it. But what, with this innovation, with this new generation of PSAs, we've been able to show that we actually obtain quite the good adhesion on HDPE and actually better than the market benchmark. And why is this important? Um, it's certainly, I think, one of these mega trends that we've seen over the last couple of years of light weighting. So if we think of the automotive industry, where the trend of light weighting means you want to adhere to multiple substrates. So you want to ensure that you've got something like stainless steel and you can adhere to plastic. And therefore having a tape that can do both is really important um, and will have an influence. And then there are markets that also are more limited by actually regulations already. So this brings us to an example from our textile market. So when we when we want to um, waterproof a felt roof top, we normally require a system that is made of a bitumen as well as a polyester non-woven that's impregnated with a water-based binder. And um, when we look at the the, the polyester non-woven, we need that impregnation because it a has to help with the really um, strong or harsh conditions during bitumization, but it's also there because we have to expect some um, temperature influences by just seasonal temperature changes or daily temperature changes, which, mean, which means the uh, non-woven might ex expand or shrink. And as soon as we have cracks in our felt rooftop, it's no longer waterproofed. That system though is normally, so that polymer blend is normally a 2K system. So we're having a water-based binder and we blend it with melamine or urea formaldehyde. And then actually when it cross linkers we release formaldehyde. Formaldehyde has been, um, the restrictions has been tightened uh, very strongly in Europe in 2015. And actually also in 2020, the State Committee of Emission Control Laws has reduced the amount of release in exhaust to even further. Therefore, with our groundbreaking Litex Sky Shield 4685 product, we actually now have a novel cross-linking system that no longer releases formaldehyde. So we are compliant um, with these restrictions, which were introduced to also, you know, protect our workers. So again, we're supporting a range of different um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals with this as well. Another feature of this product is that with this new cross-linking technology, we've been able to um, allow the hot air, hot air intake to re be reduced from about 200 degrees C to 170 degrees C. This is great news for our customers because it means they can um, save money on lower energy usage, but it also means that we're reducing the carbon footprint um, across the value chain of this product. Again, it's really great to see that we can have some um, impact um, on env environmental friendliness or eco-friendliness of this product. However, we also need to ensure that we still have the right and meet the right industry standards. So for this, we looked at the um, impregnated non-woven, once with our Litex Skyship product and the other one with the competitor, a 2K system. And we looked into the thermodimension stability of this non-woven. 
And as I mentioned before, we really want to ensure we see little elongation and shrinkage to make sure we won't see cracks and therefore not having a waterproof roof anymore. And with our Litex um, SkySheet technology, we actually see a lower um, elongation compared to our competitor, meaning we're still very well within industry reason actually outperforming um, despite having this, or not despite, with also having this more environmentally friendly system. So the last three examples were really um, to show how through um, existing markets, we were able to introduce a more sustainable solution, but also a market that um, we've actually entered as a new market for Synthema over the last five years is the making water-based binders for um, anodes. So if we think about the electric vehicle market, I think we have seen a lot of movement in that um, recently with the UK government saying to ban um, combustion engines by 2035, with car manufacturers actually pledging more and more um, towards the sale of electric vehicles. So there's certainly this um, electrification of transportation. So we have developed a carboxylated styrene butadiene rubber latex that is used as um, a water-based binder for anodes. We also still have ongoing innovations to increase material efficiency, as well as to develop a new generation of active materials and binders. So what does it actually do? So when we, when we talk about um, anode slurries and water-based binders for it, we really have to consider a few aspects. So the binders are mainly there to ensure that we get good adhesion to the substrate, that we get good cohesion between the graphite particles, but also that we actually allow the flexibility. Because if you think of our cylindric batteries, you need to roll up the anodes um, as well as the cathode. But, uh, so it's really important to have this flexibility of the film. Because the main challenge we then focus on is when we charge and discharge a battery, you normally see an expansion and shrinkage of the active material. Um, so we want to ensure that we can keep this adhesion to the substrate to ensure that the battery works for a longer time. So when we developed the products, we then looked into how can we um, investigate this? And one way was to look at a peel test. And I don't want to go into too technical details. So we know that a higher peel strength means that we've got higher electrode adhesion and cohesion. So you can see the LB4 to zero and the LB4 to two, they're both um, our products and we have a high peel strength compared to the market benchmark. If we then also investigate this in a full cell um, performance and we wanted to see what the retention um, of the battery is with our two products, these are the top two lines, we've seen that we can actually retain the capacity for longer compared to the industry standard. This um, could result in a longer lifetime of batteries, meaning that we probably are able to kind of combat this expansion and shrinking and keeping a good adhesion um, better, uh, which is also important as I think we're, we're all still figuring out of what to do at the end of life of batteries from electric vehicles. So I think this is really important um, that you can see we've also kind of are active in markets and are changing and adapting, trying to support um, industry trends and um, also actively supporting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 3 and 7 with these products. So this is this is the end of, of the talk. I, I hope I was able to show you today of how through product innovation we can very actively support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and I do believe that the chemical industry finds itself in a very unique position to do so. And when we think about potentially the kind of sustainability benefits from our products, we can really consider three different steps. We can consider the manufacturing or how our customer manufacture, the end of use, um, sorry, the end user benefit, as well as potentially the inherent sustainability benefit of a product through looking into renewable raw materials or um, compostability or biodegradation. And then just um, in case you have very specific product questions, um, I've just put a slide together with the main contacts um, in case you would like to reach out. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Teresa, and I hope that everyone can join with me in virtually uh, congratulating Teresa, uh, David and Tony on some fascinating and thought provoking presentations today. Now we can all put our hands together. But okay. Now in our Q&A sessions, there was one question for um, David. Um, both beginning state and future state showed 20% mechanical recycling. Would this not increase as a proportion of overall as we both improve recycling and improve collection? Now, this is a question for David on uh, the um, slides that he put up, the graphs that he put up on how much um, um, polymers, uh, plastics would be recycled as time goes by. So do you have any thoughts on that uh, question, David? Um, yeah, I certainly have some thoughts. I think, uh, look, I, I guess the, in, I mean, those those graphs were not put together by us, but but the view of an independent sort of consultant in the area around where they saw the trends heading. But I guess the the spirit of the question really asks, like, why why shouldn't it be more? Um, I think there's potential to be more. So there's certainly no uh, no endpoint direction in giving those graphs, but just um, I guess the challenge is. Assuming we can get better at segregation, I think there's still end use, uh, creating an end use market is probably our biggest challenge in ANZ. Um, and I'm sure Steve deals with this a little bit in the PAC group. But, uh, you know, I think we've got a lot of people who are, a lot of brand owners and a lot of uh, companies who have a lot of good intent, but um, we're probably not translating into a, 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 a set of products that can actually be used to be transformed our, uh, our, our pellets into so it's such that um, we think there's probably a natural, there's a natural constraint there around what we can actually turn it into. Yeah. Um, and that's probably where the, where the, why the 20% is, is why it's there. Right. Okay. Um, we talked about compost compostability. Um, yeah, I live in Camberwell and uh, we have these green bags to go in the Fogo bins for cost compostable plastics. Um, I think uh, Tony was uh, somewhat uh, had some somewhat uh, negative uh, comments on plastics which uh, are compostable. Do you want to elaborate on that Tony? So, well I think you know I've like I said, ev everyone really wants to do the right thing. So um, if, um, and it depends what your concerns are. If, if your concern is um, plastic waste, right, and plastic waste getting in the sea, then obviously compostables make sense. Mm -hmm. um, if your concern is greenhouse gas emissions, then they don't. It's kind of, it's really that simple. And, and because the consumer doesn't understand that subtlety, um then they can be made to feel good about themselves by buying a product that's labeled green even if yeah. the manufacturers of those products are aware of the fact that they are not yeah because, you, you, because you're, the demand's there you're spot on it, you're, you're spot on tony you've you've hit the nail on the head it's uh it's it's the the thing about with some of these alternative materials it's um is that they're, they're quite uh, they appeal to the consumer's emotion, so yeah. they they provide a perception that they're green, and this is uh, this is what we see a lot in our industry and and fighting against as well. Um, but the reality is, and what you've presented this evening, you, 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 by the way, your presentation was quite uh, inspiring and and fantastic, and thank you for that. Um, you know, and. Uh, um, it's uh, it's it, we've got a long way to go, you know, particularly around compostables. Compostables do have a do have a place. Yeah, but yeah. And I, it's and I um, it's but the, the problem is with compostable is that it, you know generally home if a lot of a lot of plastics that end up in the home composting environment they don't break down because they're not they're not uh, designed for home compostability. And this these are the things that consumers aren't aware of. Um, so it's still, as far as compostables is, is concerned, it has a long way to go yet. I agree. I think it's a lot has to do with the kind of like regulation and industry standards that are out yeah. there. Um, I've had to deal with a lot of kind of questions, biodegradation or compostability and even picking the standard you then want to test for uh, yeah. or label with is 
too complex and I think yeah consumers then can't follow anymore because why would you know if it's industrial or home compostable and what does it mean to them so yeah, yeah. that's why our circular economy program actually has linguists involved so you know we went <laughs> I went to the English department and found an English professor who was willing to work on labeling um and uh, and 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 how to give agency to the user of plastic in order that they can do with it what you know, the most appropriate thing. I, I guess, Richard. I guess look, we also see, like in your suburb of Camberwell, that the the green plastic bag, which in itself is compostable, is really the facilitator for organic waste. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and taking organic waste out of landfill. So I guess where we see that role of compostable and a facilitator for other waste management strategies, I think that's probably where we see a, a good application, but definitely into industrial composting, not into home composting. I think that's a, that's a key differential and yeah. an important one. Um, yeah. but, it, but it goes with that whole organic waste sort of, sort of approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Can I uh, bring up a point? Hand. Yeah, thank you for that, R Richard. Um, my, my observations currently are that we pay a lot of attention to mechanical recycling and particularly to investing in hardware to improve the supply chain, which definitely needs to be done. But, there is a but. My question is, why don't we put similar amounts of money in explaining things to the general public and the customer. Because we all know that they want to do things and they want to do things right, but there's not enough time and money being spent on explaining <coughs> things. And as you all know, that it needs to be repetitive and you need to accept that these processes take five to 10 years before you have some success. And that means that you must be persistent in what you say and what you tell. And I personally think we are not paying enough attention to that. Is anybody having an opinion about that? I think uh, I'd agree with you, Han. Um, the problem that people have is that uh, unless you do a proper cradle to grave analysis you can come to the wrong conclusions as to what is more or less environmentally uh, friendly um, and I think this is one of the things that uh, it's easy for journalists to take a view that uh, this is recyclable or this is compostable or and so on without actually understanding what the implications of that might be. As Tony said, some of the things going to be compostable um, are going to produce more CO2 emissions than uh, things which are going to sequester the carbon and bury it and it'll stay there forever. And this just, it is yeah. really important to invest in both the, um, the technical capability and the um, and the, the social change around a plastic circular economy, because we, we won't be in a position, you know, whilst we're still emitting carbon um, to make plastics, we won't be in a position to do any, you know, to, to, to sequester carbon. So, so mm -hmm. until we've sorted the energy system out, we can't, we can't move away from recycled and reused plastic. We have to continue to recycle and reuse. So, you know, the, and I really want to emphasize that what, what I presented was only makes sense when you've decarbonized and more importantly, defossilized yeah. uh, the energy system. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, in the meantime, making sure that people understand that actually today a plant bottle is worse than a fossil bottle if it's made from PET, uh, because if, you, if you're worried about the environment in terms of of mismanaged waste, then you can't tell the difference between the two. And, and if you're confer, concerned about the greenhouse gas emissions, then the answer is fossil, fossil. Um, so, so getting those messages out, I think is really important. And, and you know, 
Um, marketing is both the problem and the answer, right? You know, we've we've had we've had fifty years of training, behavioural training, to be single use, throw it away, plastics consumers. Mm -hmm. um, that behavioural training was provided by uh, the consumer goods industry, and the consumer goods industry now has to use all those marketing skills to turn us into a circular economy. Um, and and it and it's it's that business that needs to do it. Yeah, with the help of, of the chemicals industry, but it's the it's the fast moving consumer goods industry that needs to train people in new behaviours, because uh, it absolutely it absolutely has trained them in the behaviours we want to change. Uh, I think that only, sorry that I interrupt, but that is exactly the issue which we have. Yeah, not enough money being spent on yeah. explaining all these things. Yeah. If you don't do that, then all the good intentions fall apart. Well, well, no. So, so my point is that the 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 fast moving consumer goods industries are currently training people to make bad green choices. They're investing a lot in in things that are greenwash, um, hey, whereas what they could be investing in are things that are. Um, well thought out and evidenced yeah. environmental benefits. So yeah, money does need to be spent, but it needs to be spent people who by the people. But by I mean, if, if we could do it all through policy and taxation, that would be great. But you know, sadly, those days when people gladly paid more tax have long gone. Yeah, um, I think they have. Now, Teresa, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was just going to talk about an initi initiative that I've observed in the UK. So, you know, it's very com like it's quite complicated of what you can recycle and what you can't. And um, like something like a multi layered packaging is quite complicated. So crisp bags, which very popular, popular in the UK. And um, so a lot of supermarkets started now initiatives <coughs> where they're like, you can come back to Tesco and recycle, um, you know, your crisp bags. Um, and that kind of raises awareness, but at the same time, it requires people to actively put the crisp back somewhere to then take it to the supermarket to remember with your next shopping to return it. So I think it gets so complicated. So even we have to be really careful if we innovative new packaging to then add another thing that we need to teach of how to recycle or how to deal with it, because um, it can be overwhelming, I think. Mm. Yeah, spot on. I agree. Now, look, it's now nine o'clock in Melbourne. It's just after nine o'clock in Melbourne. And that's the time that we said that we would uh, uh, pack up our uh, webinar. So um, I'd like to thank our three speakers, David, Tony and Teresa, for some fascinating presentations, some interesting, thought-provoking, stimulating and possibly somewhat controversial presentations as well. So thank you. Um, I know that uh, Yvonne uh, will be contacting, contacting each speaker separately to more formally express our thanks to you for your presentation today. Now, our next webinar in the Plastics Frontiers series will be held on Tuesday, May the 4th at 7.30pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. That will be after the school holidays, after the clocks have been uh, put back here in Melbourne and Sydney and and of course Adelaide. Uh, Han uh, from the Society of Plastics Engineers will be chairing the session and the overall theme will be solving the challenges facing our uses of plastics and the specific focus will be on dealing with litter and pollution. And a range of uh, presenters from industry will be speaking including Steve uh, uh, Petinakis from the PACT group. So again, thank you to our generous sponsors, BASF, Reckitt Benkiza, Quenos and Foundry Intellectual Property. Just one other point I'd like to make, the SCI, the Society of Chemical Industry, is running a webinar charting the path towards sustainable and circular food packaging on Wednesday, May the 5th, starting at 2 p.m. British summer time. And another webinar, Plastics from Cradle <coughs> and Resurrection, on Wednesday, June the 9th, 
starting at 10 a.m. British summer time. Now, neither of those times is particularly good for us here in Australia, but for participants uh, from overseas, they might be a bit better. For more details, have a look at the SCI website, which is www.soci.org. So thank you everyone once again for participating in this webinar. Special thanks again to our presenters. And uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, can I wish you a good night or a good morning or what the, they say in the banks, have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. And a happy Easter. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. And Teresa, all the best for your trip to Australia. Um, when do you think you're going to be able to come here? My flight is booked for the 15th of May. Um, fingers crossed. I don't really know. <laughs> well, I hope it all goes well. Good. Good Thank luck you. with that. Good luck. <laughs> Thank good luck.